Awesome. Philip, thank you so much for, for joining the show. We're, uh, we're really pumped to have you. Uh, we, right, we've no, been hold on. Doing a lot Before of, I even get follow. started, is it yeah. Baudry? Did I get that Baudry. right? Yep. Baudry, where in the world did you grow up? <laughs> to get that I, name? So, I mean, I grew sure up in the friend. South, so we have all these yep. weird Southern <laughs> names, like, you know, Down South, Hib- they call me Hibbets, Boudreaux. Thurston the Eighth, or something like that, but like Baudry, like, g- give me the Baudry background. Yep. So uh, I don't know if my parents loved me or hated me. <laughs> But uh, I'm from Idaho, small oh, town. Oh, really? Horse, okay. Yep. A horse ranch out of out of Malad, Idaho. Um, there's an old uh, an old author named Louis L'Amour. Have you ever heard of Louis L'Amour? Uh-uh. So he writes old Western books, and he wrote a book called Baudry's Law. It's spelled the same. So yeah. So needless to say, awesome. You can call me if you're from the South. You can call me Boudreaux. That's what they call me down there. So. <laughs> <laughs> you actually have to be from Louisiana. Yeah, uh, to be cool. Boudreaux. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Sorry, Everybody we went off the rails everything. to begin with. Uh, Austin, no, sorry, right. your, your name is not as sexy as Bo. I know. I'm going to have to change it. <laughs> Talk about it all the time. Make it a little harder. Give, give me a better story to tell. Yeah. yeah all right. Real. Let's jump in. I'm good. I just yeah. had to throw that out to start. <laughs> no, I, I, we're not even cutting that. That's staying the whole time, though. So, <laughs> good. Um, cool. So, no, I, so let's, let's just kind of jump into it a little bit. Tell us. For those of you that might be living under a rock and not know who Philip is, Philip, tell us, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and kind of what your background is. Uh, well, that's a loaded question. Yeah, um, yeah. They, so uh, uh, within, within 45 minutes, yeah. how about that? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the gist of it is, is that I uh, have been working in political marketing for 25 years now. Started in 1996. Worked on eight presidential campaigns, been on three winning presidential campaigns. I've been a part of 1,407 election victories from president to uh, state representative to Congress to senator to governor. Um, and I don't know your, you, you, you know how old you guys are, um, but when I turned, when I was kind of hitting that 38, 39 window. Um, I said, man, I've been doing this my whole career. It feels like I have another challenge ahead of me. And I have always been obsessed uh, with corporate marketing. And I just wonder what the parallels were between sort of how we run campaigns to elect presidents. And then like, how does that work uh, on the corporate side of things? And so in 2015, I I created um, a couple of different marketing agencies, one um, in politics and then one in corporate world and we've been sort of applying the the way that politicians get elected the principles behind those marketing strategies to help businesses start up companies grow their business and shoot out of the gate because if you think about it politics like the ultimate startup company you know we typically have a candidate and he has no brand no name id they don't have their you know millions of dollars that they plan to spend in the election they have to actually raise the money um, and they start at zero. So they decide to run and they're like, ah, I think I can raise a hundred grand. I don't know. Like they just have to start at zero and then they just have to start calling everybody they know and trying to network like crazy and get their message out of what they want to run on and have people contribute. And ultimately they raise the money to such a level that it's now time to start spending it on marketing and go win the election. And so that's, you know, kind of where we come in. The only difference between this and, a, and marketing like a brand new product or service is either I spend all the money that candidate gets me before election day, or I'll never work again. Because if I leave any money on the table by election day and that candidate loses, that's like your reputation is going to be killed forever. Right. So it's weird because in this business, We ramp up like crazy, like a startup company, but then we have to spend everything all like, let's just say we raised 2 million. We have to be at zero on election day or (laughs) our candidate loses and we could have spent more money to win the race. So, um, but that's, uh, so we've applied this to be pretty aggressive when it comes. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah. People that work with me know, I mean, I'm a hard charger because, you know, in politics it's win or die. Um, And the honest answer is, as a political marketer, if I lose more than I win, I'm out of business. So all I ever think about is innovation uh, and execution and trying to outwork, out hustle, out strategize my opponents. And then when I kind of took those principles over into the corporate world, I realized "Eh, most corporate marketers go, uh, we're we're settled into long term contracts and these guys can't do anything and we don't have to do a ton for them. And, 
you know, whole, uh, Bodri, you asked about this before we interview, but I wrote a whole book on sort of the, what I found to sort of be some of these uh, unethical practices by corporate marketers. And, and the reason I did it is I interviewed over a hundred CEOs for my first book to, to understand how corporate marketing would work if I decided to go into that field. And I just heard the same thing over and over. Oh, we've gone through like six agencies. We fire them every like six months. They over promise, they under deliver. Uh, we, you know, we had this startup money and we spent all the money and then we were out of money and we had to go back to the VC or the, uh, the angel fund or whatever it is. And we had to ask for more money and it's just been a disaster. And here's why it's a disaster. I mean, I wrote that book three years ago, but the fact is, is if you look at it now, uh, Jonah Berger, uh, wrote the book contagious and, uh, is at the Wharton school of business says that we're seeing up to 10,000 ads per day Oof. online and offline. 10,000 ads per day, the average person. So many ads. How is that even possible? If, well, just think about all the digital yeah. ads are scrolling, you never see. Think about the billboards you drive by every day. Think yeah. about, you know, if you do have your radio on, on or, or you have free Spotify. I mean, it's endless, right? Yeah. And if you're just scrolling on your phone, like how many things are going by you every day? So, the point that I'm trying to make is if you're running in a world of 10,000 ads, then you got a more competition. It's not, it's not your co competitors in your marketplace. It's everybody you're competing against. You're competing against their ads. And so what's making you stand out? What's keeping you, uh, what's going to make you sort of what I call the difference that makes the difference in your ads. Actually, I'll give you a quick example of what I mean yeah. by that. We do a lot of work with startups and uh, we've, we've helped some app companies like the guys you guys talked you guys talk to. But one of our also clients is a national pest control company. And they came to us and they were like, you know, we just spent $1.8 million on our marketing and we have lost $2 million in market share in the last few years. And we don't know why. And so we were like, well, what are you marketing to? And they said discounts. And I go, well, why are you marketing discounts? And they go, well, that's because in, in the backs of the great recession around 2009, they started running ads on discounts and it crushed and it blew their business up. And for like five years, they were on fire and they couldn't, yeah, everything was discounts, right? And all of a sudden it stopped working and they didn't know why. And it just didn't work at all. And so we have a really sophisticated data system that we can get into in a minute, but we worked with them. We tracked their customers. We, so they had, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers that they wanted to get better optics on. We overlaid that data online. We tracked their spending habits, their surfing habits, everything that they do. And we found out that the vast majority of their customer base was over 55 and had children out of the household and they had discretionary income. So they looked at discounts as cheap. They looked at quality as more important than discounts. And here, this eight, nine figure pest control company was spending all this money not knowing what their customers really thought or they really wanted. We also found out that uh, the vast majority of these customers had children out of the household, so they were contributing more money to charity. Well, this pest control company had contributed lots of money to charity, except they didn't tell that story on their website, yeah. on their brand. And they also found out uh, that this older generation of discretionary income customers wanted uh, safer green products. Well, <laughs> this pest control company had green products that they didn't put, put on their website and weren't marketing at all. So we reconfigured their whole marketing presence. We used a couple of ideas. I think there are three ideas that crush. This is, if you're going to write anything down, write this down. Uh, three ideas that crush right now more than anything else. Uh, it's humor, it's comparative advertising, and it's third-party reviews. Those uh, are just like, I cannot tell you enough. Those are the best ads that work right now. When I, comparative advertising is a lot of fun. We can get into that. It's like the negative ads of political advertising. We translated that into uh, corporate. So we, yeah. we ended up launching this campaign for them because here's the deal. In a sea of 10,000 ads per day, what's making you stand out? Now, why that's important is there is not one person on the internet or one potential customer of this pest control company that gives two craps about whether they sell green products contribute money to charities or whether they bundle services rather than want discounts because bundling makes them feel smart and discounts makes them feel cheap. That's not going to get them a pest control company into their house. They go to Google and they, they, they Google, I need my bugs dead. That's the only reason you want a pest control company. You don't give a shit about anything else. You want the bugs dead. All right, great. Now you're going to go and look up a pest control company and, the, and your SEO or whatever is going to pull up the top three. 
right? You're only going to go to three. You're not going to even more than three companies you're going to look at. Yeah. What's the difference that makes the difference in the top three? What are you doing differently? And so we knew that was what would get us, you know, where we needed to go for this company. Within six months of working with us, they had the greatest month in the history of their company, not because I did anything special. I just found out what their customer cared about. And then I projected their marketing about their customer, not about discounts, which the customer hated. And so that's that's a kind of an example of how we look at it. Is it fair to say that if they would have used that data preemptively, mm. it would have saved them $1.8 million? Well, no, it would have <laughs> saved them a hell of a lot more. They spent yeah. $1.8 million. They lost $2 million in market share. Yeah, so... They yeah. spent one eight one point eight million to lose two million in market share. Yeah. So it was more than one point eight million. Yep. And you know, when they went through with us, I think, you know, we ended up spending thirty five, forty, fifty thousand dollars up front. You can say that's a lot, I get it, but we can talk about this later. We sort of had this foolproof way that we do it, but in order to do it, you're never gonna lose that you're never going to have a moment like that. Now, if you ask them, should I have been smarter and invested in my customer earlier? They would have obviously said yes. Yep. It's the one mistake I see almost ubiquitously across the board with every company that comes to us. And, and that's everyone. I feel like a lot of the people or the new founders and CEOs that we end up talking to, they are 100% like dedicated just on like the product. And so in this scenario, like uh, the, the founders that would come, they would care more about what products they were using or care more about how they're going to go about giving discounts or, or different things um, and spend literally zero time actually talking with a customer. And that's one big problem that a, a lot of the new founders have is they don't start with the customers. They don't start with the real data. They don't do any form of validation and instead jump right into the product, which ends up losing up hundreds of thousands of dollars at, at the end of the day. They end up giving people what they don't want. And I think that's a really good transition into this new book that you're, that you're uh, building. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you basically outline five steps into basically uh, the, the perfect system. And just real quickly, kind of narrow down like what those five steps are, and then let's dive a little bit deeper into each one of those. It actually started with a massive <laughs> failure. So the, one that's of the, the best story start okay, ever. Good. Let me tell you about how bad I was. Um, we launched this corporate marketing agency, and I, th I thought to myself, we have the secret sauce in the way we, we run politicians, and businesses just did this. They would grow exponentially. And that premise is still, I believe, correct. The problem was I didn't have a systematic approach to it when I started. And so we were hired by a um, almost nine-figure supplement company. That company came to us and said, you know, we, we love uh, this concept. Help us build this out. So we started doing some things for them, and they were happy. And, they were, you know, we, we ran their data. We found out everything we wanted about their customer. And then we said they had built a lot of their brand on Instagram. And so we said, oh, we have this great idea. We're going to run by you. I said, uh, you know, we're going to start running some Instagram ads uh, on these things. And um, the first thing we posted for them was a picture of, like the bottle of their supplement, their number one selling supplement that everybody loves and buys. And it was like, you know, buy this supplement. You know, we had some tagline on it or whatever. We didn't run it. We proposed this to the to the owner. And the owner went, well, what, what the hell are you guys doing? And I'm like, what? What do you mean? Like, what? We got everything. We got the data. We got the strategy and all this stuff. And he's like, Philip, if you run a picture of a bottle and let's say we put that up organically as well. It's not a human being on Instagram. And my, uh, your, my algorithm is going to, you're going to ruin my algorithm. I don't have to pay for all the people to see my organic posts because I get such traction on everything. It's because we use human beings and the ads. If you do a bottle, it's going to be the worst ad ever run. How do you not get my business? This is a question he asked me. <laughs> Pretty devastating, right? <laughs> and and I went, oh man, great point. We'll get it fixed. We'll get it fixed. And he's like, all right, we'll talk tomorrow. Well, actually, that was the last time I talked to him because he ghosted me uh, after that. Yep. And I realized the principle is right and the idea is right. I I wasn't following what it the right steps to avoid a problem like that. And so I literally like barricaded myself for like three weeks in my office and I just started writing and answering like, what do we do in politics? What is the step-by-step -step process that we take that elects presidents 
And then what are we not doing on the corporate side? And I realized that I identified this five-step process that no one in pol everybody in politics utilizes, uh, political marketers utilize to win elections for their candidates. But it's never been spoken about. It's just an inherent way that we do things. And I went, ooh, well, this is interesting. This is a system that no one's ever talked about, but everybody utilizes. And then I started thinking about it and I go, ooh, every sports franchise in the world utilizes this five-step system to win championships. Trial attorneys use it to win court cases. And then I was like, doctors use it to heal patients. I said, oh my God, this thing is like in crazy universally used by so many people except marketing agencies in the corporate world. And so I went, all right, I'm going to define the process and then we're going to start applying it to all of our clients. The results that we found is that every company that has committed to the five steps has grown their business. Every single one of them. Some of them have had exponential results, uh, but all of them have grown. Everyone. And the story I told you about the pest control company, they followed the five steps. And the reason it works is because what we do is we eliminate the risk of the business owner with each step. Every step we take eliminates their risk as far as how their marketing goes. So by the time they're ready to launch a marketing campaign, we absolutely know what's going to work. We know it's not going to work. And we don't put dollars in what doesn't work. Every business owner comes to me and says, man, we lost $100,000 on a Facebook campaign. Well, why were you on Facebook? Well, because the agency said, go on Facebook. And I said, well, what if your customers are on Facebook? Or what if they don't buy things on Facebook? And they go, well, we never thought about that. And I said, well, let's find out. So what we do is, and I'll walk through the five steps. So the first step we do is, I talked about this earlier, because I believe in this so much that I went out and created uh, an exclusive license with the largest data collection, analytics, and AI company in America. And I paid six figures for that license agreement. And I bet my whole company on it. But what they do is they have a database of 200 million plus Americans, 550 million connected devices, tracking 10 billion, with a B, 10 billion online purchasing decisions every day, and also tracking 1 trillion searches every day. And we are able to overlay a customer base, build a lookalike, add a pixel to your website. We grab their IP address. We track their movements. We actually can go back 90 days in the past and then track uh, in a continuous basis into the future to understand what the customer cares about, what their values are. I can tell you with this customer base, the social media platforms they go on in a chronological order and which ones they engage in and which ones they don't engage in. A lot of times we see 90% of the customer base is on Facebook, but they don't engage or purchase things on Facebook. So I go, that means you need to be branding on Facebook, not running ads for, for ROI on Facebook. But we find out that they're highly engaged on LinkedIn or Instagram. So now we know the platform to go spend their money. And I'm not going to spend their money unless I know. So we go and we can tell you the customer's top values in life, the top three values that they put before anything else. So if you're going to run a marketing campaign, shouldn't you know that your customers value these certain things? Like, that's just my whole point. In politics, I need to know what the voters care about and find alignment with the politician. Like that's the whole purpose of political campaigns. And so I just took that and said, well, yeah, same thing. I need to know what the customer or the client thinks, right? Whether it's B2B, e-commerce, B2C. And I need to marry that with the vision of that business owner. So there's an alignment between the two. That's step one. We find out from the data what everything says. Then after that, just like any business owner, you don't run out and spend a bunch of money and start playing whack-a-mole. Like there's no reason to run out and be tactical. So we must build a strategic marketing plan, which is our step two. We take the data, we take the goals of the company and the business owner, and we marry them together into a strategic plan, just like a business owner would write a strategic plan for his own business. So we do that. Step three is now that we know what the customer wants, and we have a plan in place, and we kind of do this simultaneously now with step two, we start building their brand their website. What does their website say? Because here's the thing. CompuWare has a stat out right now. 88% of all consumers right now have one bad experience on your website. They never come back again. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? If you go to an e-com site and it's clunky and you're like, ah, oh, fuck this. I don't trust this at all. Right? Yep. Yep. So before I'm going to go spend the client's money, right? The company's money, the brand has to be right. The brand can't be first. You need to know what the customer wants. And then you need to build the brand around what the customer wants. So when they come to that brand, when they come to that website, it speaks to them. That's the whole point. And then step four, 
once you get the brand right, is you go test the ads. So instead of spending a shit ton of money on a marketing campaign from the data that we just gave you, you may find some ads work better than others. So we believe, just like in politics, we're going to run a low-cost test campaign to figure out which, let's say we find two incredible messages that we know will convert people into that business or into being a customer or buying that app, right? There may be 20 different ways that you can test those two issues or those two talking points or those two messages. I mean, that's the most important thing is like, just because we know that message works doesn't mean that we know the exact way, precise way to message it. We need to test before you go spend a lot of money. You can spend a low amount of money. You can run uh, graphics, uh, motion graphic banners or just banners, and you can get people to click through. And you're not really looking for a conversion. You're just looking to what, you know, how many people click on a banner ad these days? So if they're clicking on a banner ad, they're, they're, they're interested. Like, yeah, that's crazy, right? right? <laughs> and so once we know those variations, and I'll tell you, in politics, like, whether you hate them or love them, I don't care. I'm not talking about Trump and policy issues or Trump in tweets or anything like that. But in 2016, Trump's campaign, and I interviewed uh, one of his digital guys for the book, but they would run one Facebook ad on one message 162 ways. No, oh, man. They would run a green background, a red background, a woman, a man, a different font, or one font, another font. They would run a, uh, uh, the message in the, in the right background, and the, in the red, right corner, in the left corner. They do it a thousand, or it's 162 different ways. And what they inevitably found was there were about 10 ads out of that 162 that blew through the roof, and they had no idea why. But if you knew out of 162 tests that 10 blew through the roof, tell me where you're going to finally invest your money. Yeah. And that's and that's step five for us. And now we're ready to launch your campaign because we know what's going to work. So if you see every step along the way eliminates the risk of the business owner. Well, and if you think about who our listeners are, too, a lot of these guys are very early on and, and money is very sacred. Right. So, yeah. I mean, we don't, I mean, not everybody has a couple million dollars to blow on marketing. So, I mean, when it comes to, to being very strategic and overall, that could save hundreds of thousands for, right. for a company. And a lot of businesses no, like maybe they, we find from the data that they are already in alignment on the brand, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, their alignment in some of these other steps. That's cool. You, you're good, but you've got to start with the customer data. It's the most important thing. It's actually how to create empathy as a salesperson. Like if you understand what other people care about, you can sell a hell of a lot more successfully. Yeah. Yeah. And when you go into like, so I want to go kind of all the way back just to, to the very beginning and, and touch up on each point just a little bit. So you've just got all of these people and you're talking all of these things. Only so many of them are actually going to be like your target customer. And real, I feel like only so many people are going to actually give valuable information. How are you actually like leveraging this AI tool that you built to know that we're, you're talking to the right people? How do you go about doing all of that? Yeah. So one, there are a lot of ways to skin that cat. So let's walk through it. So uh, the one way you do it is if you have a customer base over 10,000 customers, we overlay that customer base and we can track their movements online because we can match their name or their data to an IP address. Got it. If we can right, grab an IP address, then we can track their movements online. Mm -hmm. So we, if they buy things, if they're on Facebook, if they're on Instagram, like we can track all of that and we can tell it that's, that's one way. Yeah. Um, the second way, and by the way, we've done this for Fortune 200 companies. And what happened was that we, they were paying us between $100,000 and $200,000 for these reports. Mm -hmm. And I just went to my partner and I said, small businesses and startups could use this as well. And they're never going to pay this amount. How can I do that? So that's why I pay for the license agreement. Uh -huh. And then we charge literally pennies on the dollar to allow that to happen because I paid the licensing fee. So I just have to get the licensing fee paid off yeah. and then I can operate at a lower cost. So that's, that's how we did the, Sorry. Let me answer your key way to your question. So the second way is you put a pixel on a website. So you really want to know, or, you know, on an app, right? right? We can track the people that are coming there. And what we really find in a lot of companies is we can track their customers and then their website visitors. And then you can find the difference between the two mm -hmm. because somebody is coming to that website and not purchasing. And so you can find that way. And that's a great way to close the gap for us uh, by, find, by looking at those two audiences. The third way is to build a lookalike audience, right? So you tell me what your target market is. We can get uber granular. We just did this for, all right, uh, this is a great one. If you guys have two minutes, I got a great story on this. So yeah. there's a company called the Bola Wrap. And the Bola Wrap is, uh, it looks like a taser. 
and it shoots a Kevlar rope at a suspect. A policeman shoots it and it wraps them up and they are in mobile. In the times of Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter, this is a way to bring both sides together because the suspect is not hurt anymore. Like there's no pain. A taser kills one person a day. Obviously, guns kill people um, and cops can, can you know, act nefariously. This is a way for to shoot a suspect, put them in mobile. They cannot move. Go look it up on YouTube. Just Google Bola Rat. Not you guys, but if you're listening, right, you can do it after this, this interview. Um, and it immobilizes them. And then for the cops, now they have a weapon in their hand that is not going to get them thrown in jail or get them in trouble or anything. So it is, it is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it's um, on the NASDAQ. It's a trade company. And some of the, uh, the company came to us and said, hey, we want to uh, increase our valuation. So we want to target investors and we want to target them and tell them about when it, our ideal investors, our lookalike investors, our target market investors. Mm -hmm. So we ended up uh, focusing on New York. We ended up pulling 190,000 lookalikes. And this is what the target was. They had to have $250,000 in investments. Um, they had, we actually looked at the marketplace and it was like 90% men fell into the category. So we just targeted men. And then we looked at what were their political causes. We looked at gun control as a political cause. We looked at, uh, did they give chair to charities that gave to, you know, societal issues? Did they care about societal issues? That kind of thing. And I mean, I'm telling you guys, like we had, I'm giving you like five, we had like 20 different variations of segments that we could break this down. We got to about 190 total targets. But we ran that thing for three campaign for three weeks. We ran, I mean, the video is on our website, winbigmedia.com. It's under like recent work. It's a, it's, it's a badass video, right? But we targeted that video to that 190,000 audience only, right? That's all we served it to. Just which which is the, the investors they were looking for, right? That yeah, was their target. High market. level investors who were yep. for, for gun control, contributed charity, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. Yep. We had over 700,000 views of that video from that 190,000 audience. The stock over the three weeks that we ran that ad uh, increased like 15.4% and their market cap increased 32 or maybe 32 or 34 million. I have to look, we have a case study on our website as well. You can go read it. But the point of the matter is we were able to take that look like and drill down so minutiae in such a minute, minutia way to understand exactly who we had to go after. In fact, one of the stats that we got out of it was like, they increased um, investors that bought over 500 shares of stock by something like 174% over any previous quarter in the history of the company. And so my point is, how did that happen? Well, we followed the exact five-step formula, but we looked at the data first. No, that that makes a lot of sense. What's the what's the minimum list or like lookalike audience that you have to have in order to do something like that? nothing. I mean, look like you can build anything, Got right? You, you may have to pull a segment or two out if you just mm -hmm. get way too granular, but it's pretty minimal on, the, on that front, on the, on the look like front. Yeah. No, it's something like that is to be so valuable for all, like it really any new business. Um, and I can't imagine something like that would be like overly cheap. What do you like? That, that's crazy that you guys are offering something like that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we charge between $5,000 and $7,500 for the whole thing, for the data. Yeah. That's, that's so, I feel like that's so crazy cheap and, and can bring so much value to basically. Well, and the other thing is like, uh, we've now done this for over 350 companies. Um, we, uh, you know, Mark Cuban has given me a quote of just like jaw dropping quote, like when we went through all this data with him. Um, we've done this for a lot of people in the influencer community as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because although I don't market influencers, um, we can do the data for them and tell them a lot about the market they should be targeting. And so we've been really fortunate. I mean, from Jay Abraham to James Altucher, the, uh, business coach, he's probably the top business coach in the world named Michael Hyatt. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these people have utilized this tool and including a ton of uh, fortune 200 companies, uh, this is the same data that uh, Amazon has used, Disney has used, TurboTax, Hershey's. I, mean, I can go on and on and on. Uh, if these people are utilizing this, like, why wouldn't you in your own business if you could have – I'm literally giving the same data that they're getting. The difference between a Fortune 200 company and what I give, like, a smaller business, smaller business gets up to, like, two or three segments. So hmm. they can do a, their customers, they can do a lookalike, or, or they could do – 
a website pixel or whatever it is, right? With these Fortune 200, they're literally looking at 40 different segments, you know, 20 yes. to 25 females, 25 to 30 year old males. I mean, they just get it broken down a lot more. And that's yeah. why it's a lot. Yeah. So when you get go in and you evaluate all this data and, and you build those audiences, like what would you say from a, a marketing perspective, where do people go wrong with that data? So let's say somebody just came to you and said, Hey, give me all this data, you know, and, and I'll do it the rest. Like where do people typically mess up? The thing with us is we always do it this way. We you work with us on the data, and if you're not blown away by what we produce, then we're done. Like, yeah. you know, I, I can honestly say that the reason that the book is named The Undefeated Marketing System is because one day we had done, we, I think we surpassed our 300th, we call it the customer insights report, the data. We surpassed our 300th client doing the customer insights report, and I've never had anybody not be blown away. Mm -hmm. I always tell a client, I'm going to oversell and then I'm going to over deliver. Uh, you always hear undersell, you know, over deliver, yeah. that's not what happens here. And so I screamed to my team after we did the 300 one, this goddamn thing is undefeated. <laughs> you know, like that's where the whole name came from in all honesty, like it yeah. really did. So the data is, is badass and we do one project and if you're not blown away, you don't have to work with us again. A lot of people is, is they, and I call it the difference between a committed and an interested uh, business owner or marketer. I like committed, like in politics, we're committed until election day. We go, you know, we do everything we can to elect that, that, that politician. I like the pest control industry. Why? They're committed. If they're not running ads every single month, they're out of business, mm -hmm. right? Same thing for like car companies. They get it. Like I'm either marketing my business or I'm gone. And so you have a lot of people that come to me and they go, man, I'm really interested in that data. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden after about, they get the data, they're blown away and they go, yeah, but now I got to get a strategic plan. Yeah. I'm not interested anymore. So I, it's just the interested versus the committed, right? The committed people grow every time. The interested people eventually uh, lose interest because it's, you have, you have to be methodical yep. and a lot of business owners chase shiny objects yep. all day long. And they they love to put ideas out there. I'm one of them. It's like one of my downfalls. Like I love ideas, uh, but for us, we have one idea, and you got to implement it all the way through. So let's talk about that shiny that shiny object because a lot of our listeners right now probably have a shiny object that's in front of them. Yeah. Right. And obviously, data data is is king here, and it makes those decisions. But even yeah, I mean, even Austin, you know, when, when we were building our company and our brand, we're just like, let's throw resources right at this. Let's talk a little bit about the testing phase and, and kind of what are entrepreneurs just missing in that testing phase that they're just struggling with? Well, they miss that you're investing to figure out what works. You're not investing to, uh, if you get conversions, results. awesome. The main, that's secondary for me. You got to figure out what works. Like I could go out and spend a ton of money and then tell you what works and what doesn't, or I could spend a little money and tell you what works and what doesn't. So for me, I'm looking out for the business owner, but we, uh, we worked for, uh, one company that came to us and we were in the testing phase and they spent, I mean, they were a big company, right? But they only spent 10 grand. So, I mean, think about that. That's a mid eight figure business. 10 grand is not that much, right? We can yep. do testing at much lower cost, but they spent 10 grand. And they came back to us and they said, man, that testing didn't work. I said, what are you talking about? We found these two ads that blew everything out. Like we know we're, we were going into Black Friday. I'm like, this is it. This is what works. <laughs> and they said, well, but we wanted to make $100,000 return on that 10000 spend. And I went, you wanted a 10X? And they said, yeah. And I said, where did you get that from? And they said, <laughs> we, we just filled it in on a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, awesome. But what yeah, do you, you want to add the revenue too? Like, it's yeah, just I was like, <laughs> like you, you have to have like, we mapped out like you, like what we were doing here. And they're like, no, that's what we want. And I'm like, well, I, I mean, I can't guess results. Um, yeah. I can only deliver um, what the testing is going to find and then build out sort of a map of how we'll get results after that. They eventually said, okay, we'll run the campaign in step five. And, and we made him a ton of money. Did we 10 X them? No, <laughs> that's impossible. <laughs> yeah. um, but we made them a ton of money. And the two ads that we found in the testing phase, one was a comparative ad. We found out in the data that the clothing company had a high end tees and sweats. And we found out in the data that the, their customer didn't like cheap tees and sweats. And so the ad we ran was don't buy your clothes from a shoe company. Just don't do it. Got it. 
took a shot at Nike. You didn't even, are you offended by that? Are you, are you going to go and and cancel me now guys? Like, (laughs) no, no one's offended by that. Like, in fact, it endeared the customer to the client because they didn't like this to begin with. And we found that in the data. That was the number one ad amongst men. It was the number one ad I think they'd ever run amongst men. It didn't work as well with women, but we knew that in the testing phase. In the testing phase, we found out the number one ad with women was the authentic five-star review. So a real five-star review that we utilized in our ad from a real person, that appealed to women on the clothing front more than it did to men. You won't find these things out unless you're going to test this. We knew those two concepts would work, but we had to figure out how it would work. So so you're, you, you, if our listeners are listening, what you're saying is that money should not be, you should, don't think of it as a return. Think of it as, investing in more data. Yeah. Then. That's a great point, Roger. Yeah. Um, not, but sometimes you do get a return, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a secondary no factor. Case, that needs to be the, the right. mindset of like, if we do get a return, great. Right. But if I go into this as a new entrepreneur, that's about to launch this new product or a new app or anything like that, I need to know where to put money towards. Yeah. And I just need to pay for that data. And if I get anything great, then awesome. But if not, I still have data. You have a lot more data. You actually can go launch your marketing campaign with certainty. I don't know how many business owners go, man, I feel certain on this campaign. Almost zero. (laughs) And so what I'm trying to do is, yeah, you're going to have to invest a little money. And I'm also going to give you certainty. And I'm going to make it simple. And I'm going to make it clear. And I think that's the key to the whole thing for me. No, that's that's really like a a super important point. Because I was going to say, I feel like a lot of people probably listening to this show think that they've uh, gone through the testing phase, you know, put up two or three ads and like really put in the work, go to launch and realize, oh man, I was totally wrong. At that point, is it just as simple as going back to the testing phase and just like restarting or like, what do those people do after they, you know, invested in what they think is quite a bit of time and money into the testing phase, realizing they were wrong and are halfway through a launch? Well, I mean, I, I, honestly, my answer to that is I've never gone in the testing phase and not figured out what worked because we took the customer's values and we took the customer's data and we found out what, what they wanted to hear from that company. And we designed all of our messages around that. Some messages stood out more than others. Yeah. Um, everybody tests, all marketing agencies test. That's not the concept I'm teaching. Mm-hmm. The concept I'm teaching is you test based on what you find out in the data that the customer wants. And honestly, I've always found uh, winning messages that way. It's like you have like this undefeated strategy to, to do this. It's <laughs> so go. weird. You know? <laughs> there you go. So how do you think the marketing industry is changing with the adoption of like mobile apps, especially with like this whole COVID thing and older people yeah. getting in, in smart devices? Like, are you seeing like a shift in, in marketing just in general? Well, I'm seeing a shift in the message. Uh, whereas a year, uh, well, not a year ago, but like, let's say January 2020, Everything was, look at me, look at me, you can be me. Uh, you know, I called it the Instagram in, uh, economy where some uh, model was on a beach showing half their clothes, holding a watch up, saying, buying this watch. And you can say, oh, that's not my business. But in a way it was. Everybody wanted status and significance in their products that they wanted to buy. They wanted to make it look like they were important. And then COVID hit, and first time in like 20 years, you just saw a complete evisceration of the messages in that market. Those messages were literally the worst messages you could ever use. If you were in lockdown in April of 2020, and there was some model on a beach uh, showing you know, herself in a, in, a, uh, in a thong or whatever and saying, mm-hmm. look at me, I'm great, I'm in thailand today and you're not like that ain't gonna work right everybody's on lockdown (laughs) and the three messages that really worked were trust uh helping others and safety your product or service needed to explain to to them that hey uh we've got you can trust us uh we're here to help your family or your loved ones or yourself and we're gonna you know keep you safe and you're like okay how would you do that so like with that pest control company it was like hey we're gonna come to your house don't you know uh, don't cut pest control services in this moment. You're cutting your budgets. We'll show up. We'll wear white gloves. We'll wear masks. Uh, we'll make sure your dogs, uh, aren't touched or, you know, like we will do whatever it takes to make you feel safe. You know, you're in your home eating every meal. Uh, you got tons of trash. Uh, summer is coming. Bugs are going to come in your house. You need a high immunity 
keep your family safe, help others, right? Yeah. So we saw all that just crush last year. But now that we're back into 2021, the vaccine's being rolled out, you're starting to see the shift again. It's sort of a hybrid between <laughs> basically, it's almost just trust and uh, I'm ready to live the good life again. I want people to buy the good life. Yeah. How, how can, you know, you know, with your book, you know, rolling out here super soon, you know, as people are reading it and they're, they're pulling it off the shelves, how can people apply those five principles that you had into their industry and more specifically into like their, you know, new mobile or tech startup? Yeah. The best thing to do is uh, you've got to understand the market you're going to go target before you spend a dollar. And so we created a, a free marketing data assessment uh, at winbigmedia.com uh, backslash insights. I think you can go to philipstutz.com backslash insight as well. And it's, it's literally it takes you two seconds. And then you can talk with my team and tell them what you're looking at. And they'll give you an assessment of how you need to think about your target market what kind of data is out there and they'll do it for free and that's for anybody that that's interested in that again uh probably best to go to philipstuts.com slash insights and uh it's there for for everybody to use okay perfect and then you know one last thing that i that i like to ask everybody on this show is like what's one piece of advice that you would give like an entrepreneur you know just just starting right yeah you better be resilient uh, i mean i i fail every day it probably comes from my background. <laughs> Maybe I didn't have the best background. Uh, I sort of had to figure everything out in my life. And so constant failure, when I say failure, you know, make mistakes, learn from them, get better. That's the life cycle of an entrepreneur. You just got to keep trying and keep moving forward and never be afraid to fail. I, Tony Robbins is a great quote. The quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably tolerate. And I think when you start a business, you live in a lot of uncertainty, right, guys? Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. You know. And uh, uh, I'm pretty comfortable in that in that space. A lot of people aren't, and they're probably not good entrepreneurs if they're not. Philip, thank you. Uh, right now, you have a book out. Fire Them Now was your first book you yep. released about three years ago. Um, and then you just released The Undefeated Marketing System. That's your new book that you just released. Yeah, it's The right? Undefeated Marketing System, How to Grow Your Business and Build Your Audience Using the Secret Formula that Elects Presidents. Yep. So, and we had just talked about that. So where, where can our listeners find that? I know we talked about your website, Yeah. but let's just go ahead and drop. You also have a new uh, marketing podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, the undefeated marketing podcast. We launched it on April 6th and uh, you can find me at philipstutz.com. Um, and I have a, a email that I send out every two weeks to a huge subscriber list. You can go there and subscribe as well. And we give a lot of stuff away. So uh, go over there, sign up. We give uh, data assessments away. We do, um, uh, we do a free marketing audit for any business owner that wants to understand how to get better at the marketing. So we just do a lot of different things. There's a whole mentality that we have here. It's give first. And uh, that's the kind of world we want to live in. So that's what we're trying yeah. to do. I also follow you on LinkedIn. If, uh, if, yeah, if you're a listener, you haven't followed him, he's got great content. Uh, he's got videos with Gary V and, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's Thank awesome you. content. So, um, our, our listeners want to follow there, check out that new podcast that he's released on April 6th. And I just want to say this, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I love, like we live in a cool world right now where you can be super niche and super successful. And, uh, I love what you guys are, are putting out, uh, keep charging forward and keep serving like this audience of people trying to build apps. I mean, I think it's, uh, like, I love, I, like when, when you guys approach me, I'm like, Oh, I'll hell yeah, I'm going to do that because no <laughs> one's in that. I don't see people in that space talking about this. Right. Um, and, um, I think it's super cool. So keep, keep working hard and doing it. And, um, yeah, let me know if I can ever be helpful to you guys. Cool. Yeah, sounds awesome. good. Thanks, Philip, for, for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, really, the people who are getting started are, are going to love it, too. There's just no information. Like you said, there's not a lot of content.